Hey everyone, welcome back. Um, I decided to make some upgrades to continue to improve the usability of the uh, active suspension test rig. Um, I threw on a bit of paint and obviously I cleared up some things and made it a little bit neater in the front here. Um, I added a bit of foam padding to the bottom to quiet it down a bit and save my sanity. But the biggest improvement I made since the last video was complete redo of the wiring. On the last video, I just had a breadboard with wires going everywhere, and it was an absolute nightmare to troubleshoot and to keep running. I had a lot of wires coming loose because it was vibrating. I had a lot of crosstalk with the motor and the sensor data. It was just really a rough implementation to try to get it running. But luckily, after the last video, uh, PCB Way reached out to me and asked if I would like some custom PCBs for the test rig. And I was like, yes, please. If you don't know who PCB Way is, they're an amazing online PCB prototyping service. Uh, in fact, they're more of a one-stop shop for all prototyping in general, as they offer everything from 3D printing to CNC machining, injection molding, and a million other services. So full disclosure, I've never designed a custom PCB in my life. But there are a huge number of great YouTube videos out there that walk you through PCB design step by step. Because this is my first one, I used a free uh, software called Easy EDA. You simply go onto this website, it has a lot of the components like the ESP32 modules and some of the other components that I use already designed. And so it's really a drag and drop environment where you can pull over all these modules, lay out the PCB the way you want, and then actually create and design the PCB from there. Pretty easy process and you get this really cool three-dimensional uh, preview of what your PCB is going to look like. And then all you have to do is download something called the Gerber files, which are essentially the files that define the PCB. And it's an industry standard uh, file format. You go to PCB's website, you do some things like pick your PCB's color, the material, and a lot of other cool options about the PCB. Then you upload your Gerber files. They have a great online check that uh, reviews the files and ensures it matches their uh, manufacturing requirements, which is really cool when you don't know how to design a PCB like me. So I have to say it's a really rewarding process. Uh, the PCBs make the whole project feel much more professional, and I can't thank uh, PCB Way enough for reaching out to me and uh, hooking me up with these uh, PCBs. I designed two different uh, PCBs. The first is for the test rig itself. It's a nice big board with a separate prototyping area in case I uh, forgot any functionality. I also added a separate power supply and power filtering for the sensors that are hooked up to this board. The 3.3 volt buck converter that's on the ESP32 modules can be a bit overtaxed at times, and I found having that separate power source uh, greatly enhances the uh, reliability of the external sensors. The second PCB is much smaller, and this is intended to be used inside an actual test vehicle. The other enhancement I made was to add a user interface for the test rig for a whole load of reasons. First of all, it allows me to easily control the speeds and other configuration parameters from within the GUI instead of having to change the actual underlying code inside the microcontroller. I can easily save the data from a test run on my computer rather than having to do like a cut paste kind of operation into something like a spreadsheet. It also allows me to easily visualize the data from the run, uh, which has made troubleshooting so much easier. Pretty basic right now. I just have a small graph for the motor RPM that I really used more to tune the PID on the motor. The big graph is a vertical displacement of all the different sensors, essentially. Uh, so it's the vertical displacement of the eccentric, the vertical displacement of the sprung mass, and the vertical displacement of the suspension arm at the wheel, which is essentially the unsprung mass displacement. Since all of these are rotary encoders, I've had to do a bit of math behind the scenes to transform this data into the vertical component. Okay, so this last graph in yellow here is pretty interesting. This represents the wheel's contact with the eccentric roller. So the formula is pretty straightforward. It's the vertical displacement of the sprung mass minus the vertical displacement of the unsprung mass or the suspension arm and the vertical displacement of the eccentric. This equals the distance between the wheel or the tire and the surface of the eccentric. This graph shows that the tire should be two to two and a half millimeters off the eccentric surface. But as you can see on camera, the, the tire actually never leaves the surface. And that's because there's probably two, maybe two and a half millimeters even more of backlash in the suspension. That's just due to the tolerance and the actual joints of the suspension. 
But even though the tire is still in contact with the roller, there's a significant uh, reduction in traction because there's so very little force that's actually acting on the tire. I'm still thinking through a few other things I want to add to the GUI to provide some additional configuration. But a big piece of this I want to add is a graph of the different frequencies in the sprung and unsprung masses using some fast Fourier transforms. You know, that's going to get really tacky and I'll probably cover that in a future video. So what do we do with all this cool data? Well, I did a quick and dirty uh, ground hook controller, uh, which you can check out some of my prior videos where I go into detail a little bit about some of the more basic control strategies for active suspensions. Um, but I'm using the input from the sprung mass encoder. I'm not using the accelerometer at this time. Basically, you can see without the servo actuator turned on, the sprung mass is traveling roughly 10 millimeters vertically, which makes sense because that's what the eccentric is traveling. Then enabling the a servo, uh, that's reduced to about three millimeters of total travel. So why isn't this as good as last time? Well, no active suspension is going to be perfect. Last time I used a different approach. I used mathematics to trace the shape of the eccentric, as well as I added a phase shift to the actuation of the actuator. Um, that's important because the servo also takes time to respond. What's happening now is we have a lag in response due to the actual encoder reading the sprung mass linear vertical displacement, and then also a lag just due to the servo being able to respond. But despite both of those things, this is still a 65 to 70% reduction in displacement at the sprung mass, which is pretty amazing. Um, you're never gonna get to 100%, and I know this could use some additional tuning, but you know, just for a rough and ready active suspension controller, it's uh, pretty impressive. Um, I have a set of radio control uh, car shocks on order so that I can baseline a non-active suspension. I also want to try out some you know, reactive suspension designs using things like electronic valving and magneto rheological fluid. But I think you know, my first active suspension design that I want to try really is the ultimate granddaddy of them all. And that is a linear voice coil motor. These are a force-based actuator that can be controlled very tightly and extremely fast. And they're really cool. And I'm hoping that I can actually design a working one that I can manufacture uh, with 3D printing and some off the shelf parts. But, you know, we'll have to find out, you know, let me know in the comments what you think about this design or if there's any other types of suspensions you'd like me to try out on this rig. Well, that's all for this video. Um, until next time, uh, stay safe out there. Oh, no, 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 too fast, too fast, too fast, too fast. Whoops.